I'm going to drink my very strong coffee. Please do, please do. And please, um, uh, thank you so much, Jehan. And please, everybody feel very free to wander on and off screen, drink coffee, do whatever you need to. It really is so intimate that there's really no need to, um, you know, obviously you can turn your video off, but, but don't feel you need to. It's a very intimate context. And we're just basically chewing the fat. You know, that's the, the, the whole spirit of Unrehearsed Futures is that of a conversation. Um, so with that, I'm going to begin rather formally with, um, with the presentation of our two wonderful guests and our new fellow curators um, by, by giving you their uh, brief biographies. Um, so I'll start with you, Mwenya. Um, Mwenya Kabwe is a Zambian-born maker of theater and performance, facilitator of creative processes, a performer, writer, arts educator, and scholar with migrant tendencies. Her creative practice is focused on contemporary African theater and performance, immersive and site-specific performance work, live art, collaborative and interdisciplinary art making, and reimagining African futures. She's lectured and taught performance theory and practice in the drama department at the University of Cape Town, Wits University, and the Market Theater Laboratory, and is a PhD candidate at the Center for Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at the University of Cape Town. Now, Mwenya, uh, you you submitted, but you're you know you're you aren't you, you're the doctor now, aren't you? You're a doctor. Okay, soon. <laughs> very soon. <laughs> so, so hopefully, all lots of this. It's yeah. very close. <laughs> We're all holding. <laughs> Thank you. One. Okay, so and I'm going to ask you to, to speak much more about your your um, specialties and fields of interest, um, but I'm sure. going to now introduce um, uh, our second uh, collaborator and curator, um, new uh, collaborator, Mgeni Machali, uh, who works across a range of performance disciplines, including dance and movement, composition and performance, animation and puppetry, and site-specific performance installation, among others. He has earned a PhD in performance studies from Northwestern University, as well as Standard Bank Silver Ovation Award and the Fleur de Cap Theater Award for his achievements in directing and performance making. Ngeni is pr uh, primarily interested in black queer femme performance in South Africa, as well as Africa and its diaspora, turning towards queer genealogies of African decolonial work world making in the Caribbean, South Atlantic and Indian Ocean. These research interests frame his practical and theoretical inquiries with unreached futures as another venture into understanding the broader landscape of global theater practice. So um, welcome to you both. And um, it's really very, very thrilling to be uh, part of this expanding team with you. And so um, today, really, it's a chance to look at your interests and your fields of interest as uh, determining curatorial trajectories for unrehearsed futures, and then opening that up to everybody so we can all talk about what, um, what we have in common around your interests and around the theme of planetarity, which I think is, you know, remains to be discovered what that, what that means. I don't think anybody's taken the class on it. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, I think a great, great topic to be discussing together, all of us. Um, so uh, let's, can I, can I start with you, Mwenya, and just, can you please um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what exactly, you know, you're interested in doing, what your passions are, and what they look like when they come to the stage? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, greetings from Cape Town. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jehan. It's lovely to be here. Um, Thanks especially to anyone for whom this is not a time of day that you would ordinarily be awake. Um, so yeah, just to share a little bit about my, my theatre making practice uh, comes very much out of my biography. Um, as my bio indicates, uh, I am Zambian. I currently live in Cape Town. My home base though is really Johannesburg. And uh, I've done my postgrad studies here. And uh, before that, I lived and worked and studied in the US. And before that, spent many years of boarding school in a very small part of the southwest of England. And uh, as a result, my theater making practice really centers very much around migration and migrancy and movement. And um, I have a particular interest in African women's migration narratives. And then a few years ago, when I was doing some research for a, a production um, that I was working on with students in 
uh, the Eastern Cape of South Africa, I came across um, a rather colorful character in Zambian history called Edward Mukukan Koloso, who some of you might know, who uh, was a Zambian school teacher in the 1960s. And um, he was convinced that Zambia was going to beat the Russians and Americans to space. So much so that he started a space training program, um, and, uh, you know, just outside of Lusaka with a small group of young people. And um, they trained by swinging each other in, a, in um, tire swings attached to trees and rolling each other down a series of, of bumpy hills to simulate weightlessness. And uh, Nkoloso himself wore a cape and a standard issue combat helmet and boots. Um, and he had a crazy mustache. And you know, when he was asked to identify his, his rocket, his spaceship, it was two oil drums stacked on top of each other. So needless to say, he fat, continues to fascinate me to this day. And, and what happened as a result of doing this research, coming across him, uh, making a work called Astronautus Africanus, which was this mad immersive um, in and out of all of the nooks and crevices of um, one of the main theater complexes. Um, I uh, have become really interested in African futurism um, and, and particularly where migration, the relationship between migration and African futurism uh, meet as um, dramaturgical strategy, if you will. Um, and what else can I tell you about my interests? I work really collaboratively. I enjoy the, the less traditional, more site-specific experimental um, ways of working and showing. Um, and yeah, that's, I think, I think that's, that's a, a, a quick summary of my interests, my theater making, yeah, my theater making interests. Marvelous. I feel like there's more, but it will, it will come. <laughs> okay, yeah, please feel free to interject. Yes, cool. great. Um, so, and Ngeni, you want to tell us a little bit about, yeah, give flesh out for us what, uh, what your field of interest is. Yes, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, I mean, to repeat what Manya said and congratulate and thank people who have come in at weird hours from wherever they are in the world. Um, I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, Manya and I actually come from very similar, and I guess this is a, a, a consequence of <laughs> being on the African continent um, and being of a particular age, I think, as well, come from somewhat similar um, backgrounds and have similar fascinations in terms of um, performance making. Um, but whereas Mwenya's work is animated by migrancy, um, and that's the kind of touchstone that comes from the personal, right, that, that feeds the work, um, mine also takes off from, from similar concerns, 100% um, driven by my own experience of being Black and queer in South Africa, growing up in a very quote-unquote traditional Zulu home, um, in the kind of mid 1980s, you know, between several states of emergency, when the country is going through these major eruptions, where you know, mm -hmm. debating the the state of the nation, as it were, um, being the last of five children, um, the first to go into a private school, um, and this would have been in 1989, um, when private schools weren't generally available to. Black students. I was the only Black kid at that school when I first arrived. Didn't speak a lick of English. You have to say hello, thank you, how are you? Um, and then went through this period, which I lovingly call my Pygmalion years, um, where I, I was acculturated into the appropriate language, into the appropriate comportment for a student at St. Charles College. Um, which is why I sound the way I do, which people find surprising, given, you know, they find out where I'm from and then, they're, oh, okay, that's where it comes from. So from a young age, I was hyper aware of being embraced within specific cultural communities, but also being aware of my difference to those. Um, I've always been aware of performance being a fundamental part of how I locate myself in the world, just from that practice of learning how to speak in a particular way in order to disappear within the school of kids. So that informs a lot of my thinking. It's questions around identity, questions around blackness, um, and, and more broadly conceived as, as questions around nationalisms in the plural. Um, 
Yeah, so my work takes off from the personal. I'm really interested in this question of, of um, black, queer, black queer and black femme performance specifically, um, and, and the kinds of tactics that, that queers of color use to push back against, destabilize, and perhaps re-narrate what it is to belong to the nation and to belong to a black community specifically, where a lot of these questions are really fraught. Um, and as a consequence of that thinking, it, it, it necessarily has meant kind of beginning to think outside of the fixity of borders um, and kind of national spaces and to imagine much like Mwenya does what it means to migrate across those borders, whether they are conceptual or literal. Um, so over many years, I've, you know, in, in various forms have, have played with the personal as and the deeply intimate kind of personal story, right, as the side for a broader politics or a way to explore and engage with the politics that touches all of us. Um, the last kind of major work I did was called In Skin and looked at that period in school, but was kind of thematically built around language and, and intelligibility um, and then playing with masculinity and gender and all these other things within that. Um, and yeah, I think you also mentioned that I'm, I've, I've begun expanding into um, the Caribbean and into Latin America, um, the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, uh, because my PhD work was mostly focused on, you know, Black queer and Black feminist performance in South Africa and Africa. Um, and I became troubled. And again, this is, this is these, these geographies, right? Um, increasingly troubled by the over-determination of all stories about and of Africa and about Black people in, the transatlantic slave trade. And I began asking how else Africans have entered into global presence other than as um, objects for sale, as commodities. Um, and the work has taken me in various ways, you know, using performance as a way of thinking through, um, you know, how, how for example, um, dance practices transmitted ideas of African Africanness um, within colonial spaces without necessarily having to have arrived in those places um, via slavery. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of syncretic um, kind of modernities that emerge in, in Latin America, partly as a result of slavery, but also the other stories that emerge. Um, I'm also interested in you know, how Africa's moved elsewhere into the globe um, across the Indian Ocean, which is, is somewhat less explored, I think, in a lot of thinking around um, post-colonial Black modernity. Um, yeah, at, at the risk of, of, of uh, yapping away for far too long and, and getting too wrapped up in my own theoretical kind of world. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very, very loosely framed by um, queer and kind of feminist theory um, and practices and effectively how we can mobilize those to strategically intervene um, in these uh, kind of politics of respectability um, and these kind of national repertoires that, that come to define who we are as peoples in the plural. Can I, I'll just stay with you, um, uh, Geni, to, to discuss your, your particular interest in the curation of, of Unrehearsed Futures, which is um, a topic you've identified as voicing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and you know, how it might connect to what you just described as your fields of interest? Yeah, I guess, I guess um, voicing is, is, is a <laughs> somewhat awkward term. Um, I, I, and I was saying this earlier on, you know, it's, it's, it's about the voice as both an actual kind of material thing, but also thinking about voice conceptually and voices in plural. So I guess maybe vocality might be a more accurate term and, and more specifically polyvocality. So I'm really interested, again, because I have this fascination with language. I'm, I'm you know, multilingual home. I come from a multilingual community. And again, this is the experience of lots of Black people in this country is that we are multilingual. Um, we are polyglots. Um, so this idea of language and the voice and what the voice sounds like has always fascinated me in some ways, although I'm not a voice practitioner, right, in terms of theater. I mean, I sing, I do all sorts of things, but I wouldn't consider myself a voice theorist or practitioner, but the idea of voice interests me. Um, and, and the sense that voice can be quite deliberately attached to questions of identity. Um, so not just the texture of the voice, the kind of sonic texture of the voice, but also, um, how it locates you within a particular cultural space or within particular kind of economic categories and various other things. Um, 
And then I'm interested in what happens when multiple voices occupy, whether by choice or forced to, the same space. Right, what happens when you're speaking with one another, um, speaking across one another, what, what other kind of sonic possibilities become available when you play with all of us speaking at once and not necessarily with an interest in hearing one another, but just what it is to sit with multiple voices at once. And what, if anything, it, are we as humans but streaming into kind of these collective spaces together in all our multiple different voices? And I think that there's a really interesting um, kind of node one can think through there around um, the strategic uses of, of voice as a way of positioning oneself within the world. Um, yeah, so I guess it's it, voicing is a somewhat messy way of, of grasping at these, these ideas around um, identity, around intelligibility, around polyvocality, our capacity to either speak in multiple voices, um, but also what always attends to me and attention to voice or to sound, which kind of sonic texture is listening to, right? And practice of careful listening. So how do we listen to voices in a way that reveals perhaps points where we meet and, and diverge as well without, yeah, without over determining our understanding of our encounters and in this need to achieve anything particularly, right? Um, but just the ethics of sitting with other people and 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 laying claim to a voice or the multiple voices in which we speak because I know I could switch and we all do right so there, there are multiple ways that voicing kind of plays out um certainly my the first um session that I've curated um is obviously driven by this idea and um you will see it when it comes out in the flyer um but uh you know fabulous South African actor Tony Miyambo adapted um Franz Kafka's um a report to an academy um and the, the work is called Kafka's Aid. So again, I'm interested there in how this quintessentially Eurocentric European white man's voice um, produces a text that can speak multiply and has been sustained or, 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 or that, that circulated in a way that, that's enabled that story to kind of emerge over and over again over time. And I'm fascinated by how Tony, as a Black South African, can take that text, translate it into a performance, and it's specifically the dissonance between our knowledge of where that piece comes from, confronting his body and his voice now, um, where that piece does its work, right? Um, but also, I'm interested in why that particular adaptation of that, that work has just achieved so much global traction. It's a voice that is obviously being heard in really substantive and, and, and compelling ways and in distinctly different global spaces. Um, yeah, so, so voice in, in a broad, loosely formed sense, but, but as a way of thinking through speech. <laughs> conceptually um, speaking and, and being heard and strategizing ways to, to find different ways of speaking, different ways of being heard. Marvelous. Well, we have a voice technician in, in the room, Simon Rackler. Oh yeah? So here. Yeah. So hopefully we'll have a, be able to engage oh, fantastic. On later on. Great, wonderful. Okay, and um, uh, so thanks uh, for that. And um, Wenya, would you want uh, to then perhaps flesh out for people what um, your interest is in the topic of transcendence, which has been, which is your designed arc in the upcoming sessions. Sure, sure. Um, also feeling like it's a slightly awkward uh, term to use, but um, something that I've been interested in for a while and that has come into sharp focus um, in light of the pandemic is how our particular skills and tools and languages of theater making can be applied and put to use and repurposed in uh, different settings outside of academia and outside of um, making creative goods per se. Um, and part of this comes from an interest, um, well, it comes from a, a particular course that I'm teaching at the moment at UCT in professional practice you know, which feels at the best of times teaching, you know, 40th theater makers about something called professional practice feels contentious and awkward. But now, especially um, on top of the global pandemic, uh, South Africa is uh, experiencing um, 
uh, a protest, artists are, are protesting at the moment all over the country. Um, and our National Arts Council has made millions and millions and millions of rands um, owed to artists disappear, um, which is not necessarily uncommon, but it, uh, the scale of it this time is, is extraordinary. And what is equally extraordinary is the kind of national uh, response that artists have uh, taken and, continu and, have, uh, and continually, you know, we're still sitting with um, uh, a sit-in that is now, uh, I'm not even sure how many days old at the National Arts Council offices in Johannesburg. Um, and so in, in this context, it's so, it's wild to be sitting with students who are about to graduate with undergraduate degrees in theater and performance and be um, you know, talking about what it means, what, what, their, what their skills are going to do, um, and also how they can um, meet this new and continually evolving context, as opposed to have it um, surprise them as it, as it has us, or certainly me. <laughs> um, so it's a really, it's a, it's a fascinating time to be teaching theater and performance at all, I think. And I'd be really interested to, you know, when we open up this conversation to hear how others in the room are doing it, you know, like what your practices look like, what your teaching is looking like, what kinds of moves you're making with who and how. Um, so this professional practice course is partly what has gotten me uh, thinking about um, how to, how to think about teaching, um, students, how to think about uh, preparing them for some kind of post-university um, work life. Um, and it also comes from my own uh, practice as a, as a freelancer between university uh, teaching jobs. Um, I've done a lot of process design facilitation work, um, and particularly with a company called Ingenious People's Knowledge that is based in Cape Town and also in Geneva. And um, it, it's been a, a kind of no brainer in my mind that the, the, the languages of process design facilitation and the languages of theater making really go hand in hand. You know, I'm like, yes, of course, process design facilitation, theater making, here we are. But I've really had to become much more articulate, thoughtful and articulate about what exactly not even exactly because God knows what that is, but to just be clearer in my mind and in my speech about what it is that I bring to the table as a person who is trained in theater and performance. Um, and yeah, what my, what my skill set is outside of the context of making theater. Um, so some of the kind of um, uh, principles of, of this work that I do with IPK are things like to serve the human spirit, to um, leverage complexity and to, or to handle complexity and to leverage diversity. And, you know, these are things that I, I resonate so much with some of my core uh, principles, if you will, of making theatre, um, which if I have to articulate them are about um, my role as a theatre maker person, um, making a space for the people and the non-human and the environment to be as generous as possible in our work towards bringing something new into being. And, you know, in the theater making space, so much of this stuff feels um, taken for granted in a way. We get to the floor, we have a, a shorthand, we know what to do, process goes, work is made. Um, but yeah, just to, to, to reiterate, it's been so, uh, interesting and, and I think useful for me in particular to have to re-articulate how some of the stuff that is taken for granted in one setting um, can be applied and leveraged and thought about and put to use in a whole range of other settings. So, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in um, speaking with people who have theatre and performance training of some sort um, but who don't necessarily uh, make theatre or teach it, um, but definitely draw on those skills very directly and have, um, yeah, have really figured out ways to be uh, clear about what those skill sets and languages and tools are 
um, and use them in ways that are really interesting. So, so transcendence is the term, but it's really, you know, the, the, my interest is in, um, yeah, is in, is in having conversations with people who have, uh, I don't want to say transcended theater and performance because that sounds a bit odd and it's not what I mean, um, but who have, yeah, applied their skills broadly and continue to, and I feel like there's some interesting um, uh, site guideposts to be learned and uh, taken at the moment in this in this particular context where, um, you know, it's strategic on one level. Theatre and performance jobs are few to begin with and will definitely be fewer in the coming years, um, at least in South Africa, I'm feeling that quite strongly. Uh, so some of this is, you know, it's definitely also about thinking about, um, yeah, how to how to adapt the teaching space as well, how to think about um, what students should be leaving with in their minds even as a kind of uh, headspace, if not um, actual skills or actual ways to think about how their skills can be used. Um, so yeah. Marvelous. Well, I mean, it's it, I'm really impressed by how uh, we're sort of continuing the, 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 the direction of unrehearsed futures from the last season in that generally we're asking, what are we doing with and for people when we make theater with them? And perhaps particularly as teachers or pedagogues. So it's in general sort of voicing and transcends, what, what is this for? What are, we, what are we, as you say, bringing to the table? What's, what, what, um, what do people walk away with? What is the agency of this? Um, that was very much our preoccupation um, in the first season as well. Um, and um, I'm just um, curious, I mean, in the time that we have just remaining just the, in this uh, smaller conversation before we open it out, um, uh, one of the preoccupations in the last season was what, uh, what it is to be doing this now online, you know, what's the digital space? And, and I'm, I'm wondering if this connects to um, this term planetarity because it, because it seems to me, um, you know, um, Yanni, when you're talking about migrations and so forth, it seems that we are on some per level perhaps doing a bit of an imaginative migration whenever we go online and uh, into this space that is sort of between us um, globally. And just sort of that perhaps is the second thread from Unrehearsed Futures is um, what does, what does the online, the digital, the, these international connections, what does this open up for us as theater practitioners? Uh, can we call that um, an emerging planetarity? What would that be for us? I'm just wondering if you're, if you have anything to say about, about that before we open it out to some questions. You can just hop in if you want to unmute. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess it, in very obvious ways, it's, it's the big question right now um, for us as teachers is, is engaging with that. I guess one of the things that that I, I've been going to in my thinking around planetarity and, and performance specifically um, is that I'm, I'm immediately struck by, and I think we've spoken about this in terms of presence, right? I'm struck by that kind of dual thing that's happening is that this um, kind of affords us an approximation of proximity, right? Um, but it's curiously disembodied in some ways. Um, I'm not even standing in a room, you know, at a podium or walking amongst people. I'm literally sitting at a desk in a room that's been converted for the purpose of allowing me to connect to a world that I can't physically enter into um, as a part of my teaching too. And, and it, it really has got me thinking also about, um, you know, if we're thinking planetarity, is it's the tension <laughs> between the impulse to step outside of these kind of global globalist frameworks to something that perhaps decenters humans, right, that is not anthropocentric, and yet performance ironically is one of those things that relies, if anything, on the recognition or the capacity to recognize other humans. Um, so it, it, we're kind of stepping out into this kind of scale that, that, that exceeds the global, um, that is its excess maybe, 
but we're moving simultaneously into this deeply intimate space that relies on the recognition of our fundamental like humanness, right? Um, so it's both a, a, a kind of um, decentering of, of, of an anthropocentric worldview, yet at the same time, has to emerge from a grounding, perhaps more explicitly in the body than, than in any other, <laughs> than in any other moment. Yeah, so it throws a whole lot of these, these assumptions around performance, around the body, around presence, around materiality, um, into complete disarray. But I, I don't think that that's a, that's a bug. It may very well be a feature. I'm still trying to figure out what the feature is for and how to leverage it um, to do critical work as well as kind of actual making performance work, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, Wenya, do you have anything to say uh, uh, before we, we've got some wonderful questions in the chat? Um, do, would you like to say something about how the digital uh, space opens up some kind of planetarity in your practice or, or what that means to you, planetarity? Yeah, sure, just briefly. I mean, on a very practical uh, kind of superficial level, it's been amazing to be able to have um, people who are not in Cape Town in my classrooms, uh, you know, to bring in my network from Johannesburg even to interface with a group of students who are here in, in the Western Cape is, um, yeah, is really, it's lovely. Um, so on that level, you know, there's that. And then I, I, I can't, it, it bumps up against notions of equality and inequality so forcefully as well. I mean, you know, even we started, we were talking about the um, uh, vaccine rollout in some parts mm. of the world. And <laughs> all you have to do is, is, is take a scan of how, uh, you know, how the, the rollouts are happening when and how and amongst what kinds of populations to, you know, it feels, it's, it's so weird to, well, it's not weird, it's disarming over again, you know, to kind of be reminded that imperialism is alive and well in, uh, you know, in many ways. And, and uh, I haven't, our vaccine rollout conversation has started, but my God, who even knows when uh, at some point it was definitely happening this year for you know mm. my particular demographic and now it's definitely not happening this year because it's late already um you know questions of access and which students have data and need to be on campus and who can stay at home and be uh, fed and watered by their parents and on their parents you know fast wi-fi all of this you know, all of this stuff is kind of bumping up against um, a real opening up and uh, um, a real, um, yeah, I guess there, there are questions of access that come to mind when I think of planetarity and they are at once liberating and also um, just really reminding of particular kinds of inequalities. Um, and we're back in a space of, you know, asking ourselves as we have for a long time, those of us who teach in this part of the world, um, how to bridge the access, the access gaps. And, and this feels like a huge one. And if we are going to be teaching and learning and working in this way for the foreseeable future, then there's real work for us to do um, mm. to, to figure out how to, how to make it work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's kind of front of mind at the moment, um, but I'm very happy to open it up now, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you're bringing up the kind of shadow, which is global, globalization, isn't it? So you've got planetarity and globalization as being kind of the, 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 the terms that are being kind of, in a sense, you're saying confronting each other. Like, when is it, okay. when is planetarity, what is the good side of it? And then what is mm. the, you're bringing up the shadow of it. Shadow. That, mm. Very poignant, yeah. Um, let me let me just um, uh, because we're it's such a small gathering. I think it would be really great if people just um, unmuted and, and spoke out uh, some of these really good comments here. I mean, I'm just scrolling down, and I think Jehan, yours was you came first in thinking about voicing. Do you want to just speak that out? It well, it just I'm just uh, it just got me excited about the idea of I just remember always not not paying enough heed to uh, movement trainers who talked about working with the Indian body versus another body. Um, and, and I just thought, no, but the body is, you know, we all have bodies, but the same way voice has 
such unique identities and everything I'm going to spoke about, I just suddenly found myself, well, why that there's a complete uh, analogous analogous conversation to be had about about the body as a tool of communication, as a tool of social interaction. And so mm. it just made me think about the fact that there are unique identifiers in the way we move, the way we hold ourselves, the way we uh, 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 communicate with our body. Um, and therefore also uh, how an actor in training has to put on, like I have a strange moment right now where, where uh, uh, an Indian actor who's going into a film called me and said, I need, a, I need somebody who, do you know anybody in your global network who could teach me about an American accent? And the actual person I thought about was, was the voice teacher over here, who's a Vasta trained voice teacher who's Indian. And uh, she's, and I'm like, she can do this for you. And uh, it's a bit of a segue, but I mean, I, I kept thinking about that more commodified idea of this is all universal, this is all universal access. And it's, mm. I'm just checking myself because I find that this is extremely globalization based thinking versus um, the opposite, the antithetical. And I'm just finding myself listening to this going, gosh, even the vaccine thing, I was thinking about how long it's going to take India to do this. And that's the last comment I made, but there's many more comments and we should listen to them and, and have those conversations. But why am I thinking about, you know, the rate of the US versus India's vac vaccination? If I was really thinking about us as a, as a single being, and I'm not trying to do this in a kumbaya kind of way, but just as a way to open up the frameworks in my head, then I should be thinking about, well, how long will it take us to get to 7.3 billion vaccines? Um, which is actually 14.6 billion shots if you're doing a two-dose regime. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not thinking like that, then, then, you know, or maybe by thinking like that, however impossible that thought is, um, how does that translate back to whatever my immediate moment or thought or impulse is? And so that's what you've got me thinking about. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Yeah, um, uh, Mark is also speaking to that in, in terms of your, what you were first saying, um, Jehan, about, about the voice and about the particularity of the voice. Mark, do you want to, do you want to say anything about, um, I know in the British context, accents and voice are, are so absolutely crucial. Yeah, sort of. I think that's changing, but for a long time, there was an assumption that there was a received pronunciation, a sort of a particular way of speaking. It was actually a very middle, um, um, upper middle class way of speaking English. Um, but I think, I suppose part of what I put in here, I put it like a statement, but it's more of a question. And it's, it's the ways in which accent sort of, when people speak, their accent is, is there straight away. It's in the relationship that you have with your own voice and with the voices of other people and with what you're hearing from other people. And it's it's a very subtle and insidious thing. It, it, you sort of notice it, but don't notice it. Um, and that the extent to which you notice it and or don't notice it very much relates to your own social context and cultural context. I think it it, it reveals if if you are alert to it, it reveals things about you and about um, how you how you're situating yourself. Um, I think also it sort of positions you straight away you kind of immediately, even on a subconscious level, I think, begin to um, understand where you're sitting in relation to other people because either they have the same accent as you or they don't. And there are all sorts of um, political, cultural, colonial uh, uh, forces that come into play just as soon as people say a few words. And that's an incredibly powerful thing. And yet, you know, often we don't pay attention to that in terms of um, how that then relates to making theatre and to training for theatre, I think. I, I think. Um, the challenge then is what, in what ways do you let students bring their own voices into the, the training situation? And I think on one level, yes, that's absolutely appropriate, but it, you can't do it uncritically because otherwise you're not empowering students to understand what happens in terms of their use of their own voices, uh, their own bodies and movements, all, all of that. You're not empowering them to be aware of what happens dynamically in, in terms of how those, those social and cultural forces start coming into play. Um, and, and I think it would be naive in some respects not to acknowledge that and not to help students through that journey. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah no, we have we have some voice uh, teachers. I mean, I know Simon, we've a voice teacher in the room. I'm I'm sure that other people in the room are also uh, 
practicing specifically? I mean, you know, I know that you're talking about something more uh, bigger than uh, just voice, I mean, voicing, but it departs from that for embodied reality of, of speaking, um, Gany. Um, just wondering if any voice teachers in or people who teach voice, yeah. Please. So I was just gonna say that that um, what what Mark points me to is the implicit relationship between the voice and the body, right? Is that it, voices are always embodied um, and always bring with them whether that that context is is marked sonically in how the texture of usually English in this case, right, is being spoken um, or not. Is that yeah, the voice becomes a, another register for the kind of history that students are bringing into the room with them, right? Um, whether we like to or not. So even this idea of the neutral actor, the neutral voice, I, I think I push back a little against as, as a practitioner and somebody who, who trains young students for exactly that reason. I mean, our foundation course was recurriculated for specifically this reason. The first thing our first years do when they arrive now, instead of having Shakespeare thrown at them or you know, a text that they interpret is just talking and engaging with their own life stories and each other's life stories. Because we've come to a realization in some ways that we can certainly yield more interesting results. Um, I guess more, I, I don't like the word, but ethically kind of grounded practice from the students if they are aware of the fact that they enter into that room as one voice amongst many, as one body amongst many that bring all with their own histories, right? And that, that in some ways one needs to acknowledge that and recognize how it can be mobilized to engage in the practice of performing um, with more care, with, with, with a sensitivity to the other lives you are taking on when you appropriate a voice for your own purposes in performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to say, Israel, I'm sorry I didn't um, uh, pick up on your comment. I couldn't find you in the room, so I, I, I passed over it. Did you want to read out or speak out what you were uh, interested in saying? Um, I found you now. If you're there, Israel, hey. Um, okay, we'll let him pop in if, he, if, he's, um, if he's back. Um, uh, so uh, I'm just really curious about uh, the, the, we also have two uh, mimes in the room and, uh, and this, this is an interesting uh, sort of juxtaposition between the focus on voice. And I'm wondering if, if in fact the, the, uh, this movement onto the online and so forth prioritizes speaking and words and, and, and what happens to the body. I mean, we, I think we talk a lot about the body but I'm really quite curious about whether or not, I mean, it's almost like, I, I, I sort of feel sometimes that we're talking about it because we know it's disappearing and sort of we wanna make something of it. But, but uh, because I really do wonder what um, what's happening uh, as we move more and more into the into this mediated uh, space? What what actually happens with the body language? You know the the specificity of of how we move as well as how we speak. Just um, wondering if we have some thoughts about that in the room. Many many people working in in movement and in physical praxis. Please unmute yourself. It's 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 really you don't have to put it into the chat first. It's a free for all. Then I'll, I'll just jump in for Again. a second. Um, hello, everyone. And I'm sorry I'm late. I was teaching. Uh, <clears throat> the voice is, or the word, I should say, seems to be taking everything over. And I've been pushing against it, uh, quite honestly. I have my students right now telling true stories and false stories. and. And, and, and they have been pushing more and more towards nonverbal storytelling on Zoom. And the stuff I'm getting is blowing my mind. There yesterday, uh, this young woman had a jar, a very short jar of water, and she had a blue blanket and she moved the blue blanket. So the jar of water was in the forefront and the blue blanket just came in and out. 
and she was pushing it with her feet. So you couldn't even see, she was pulling it with her hands when it needed to go backwards and pushing it with her feet when it was going forward. So you, you, you didn't see the motor, if you will, of anything. It was a hidden motor. And she was making sounds and we were at the beach. And we, the entire student body who was watching this thing were transported in a place and time. And then she yelled and from above, I don't know how she did this, but she dropped some red into the jar. The, all of a sudden there was blood in the water and she was screaming, mom, mom. And it was, I was just, I was blown away by how resourceful uh, our students are when we give them the opportunity to, to not lean on the word. And, and so I, I just wanted to put that out there because the, they're blowing me away. They're blowing me away. I, I could share, a, she, this young woman also did a film um, that I could share with you. It's a minute long film, but it's, it's, it's mind boggling what she did with her other story. Um, it's, it, she's, I don't know. Do, can I hijack everything and, and show you a one minute long film? <laughs> Let me um, find it. Hang on, hang on one second. It's right. Everybody make some popcorn. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. So here, copy. Okay, I'm going to share my screen if I can. Um, desktop. And now I'm going to go here. Talk, and plug this in. Oh, I need to move this down because there it is. And I go duck and boom. Okay. And and this was this was her other story. So then it was us, up to us to see which which of the two stories were true or false. And I just thought I don't know. She she blew us away with that. Uh, it, and I so I I guess my point is that the voice. What's more important than how the voice sounds is that we give our students their voice, whatever that voice is, uh -huh. because they teach me more than I can possibly teach them when they use their voice. And I'm sure it's the case with, with the rest of the people. This is marvelous. I mean, uh, I think what that, I mean, that's such a brilliant, um, brilliant uh, piece of student work. It, um, I, I think you've raised some interesting, to my mind, controversy because, um, because we have been, and I'm very curious also, Mwenya and, and uh, Mgeni, what you think about this. 
um, in the last um, in the last Unruh Future series, we were at times slightly preoccupied with um, the metaphorization of these terms. So for instance, voice, Daniel, you talk about voice and, and obviously what we're getting is mostly we're getting images, right? Um, so it's, we're sort of metaphorically speaking of voice and then the body is, so again, there's a kind of metaphorization of the body, um, which I think has, seems to have a lot to do with the, the movement towards digital. And um, so essentially, you know, we're talking about film. This is a kind of, you know, film art that we're, we're, we're practicing now due to circumstance and also uh, the pandemic, but also due to the sort of prevalent trends in the culture and the, um, so I'm just curious about whether we feel any sort of um, also, uh, some, something more, perhaps I would say, conservative in the true sense of the word. Uh, are we? Are we also? Are we also resisting at all? Or, or is there any resistance that we'd like to, you know, create around um, the 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 metaphorization of some of the things that, as theater practitioners, we have been doing in the past? Um, just curious about that. In particular, the two of you, but also just in the room, if anybody wants to speak to that. Is that a conversation stopper? <laughs> no, well, I'm going to, I don't, I feel bad jumping in again. But what's interesting is that I think puppetry also mm -hmm. becomes, because, because you talk about, you talk about the body. So we have an, an, another exercise I do when we're in the studio. I ask them to do a Bunraku play, but we don't have puppets. And so they, they, I give them a length of rope and they must not anthropomorphize the rope. I don't want a, hi, I'm a little rope and I'm going to talk to you kind of thing. I want the rope to become ropeness and, and, and they empower the rope then. And there are three of them and they're manipulating it very much like a, a pedestrian bunraku, but it's not at all pedestrian because the rope is not, it's not a recognizable character. It becomes a, it becomes a metaphorical character. And, and, and depending on the sound that they give it or the, or the shape that they give it, it becomes more about the dynamics of rope than and yet they tell stories with it. And so I, 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 I think that, I think that my eyes are being opened by this digitalization because I can't do any of the exercises yeah. I've been teaching for 35 years. Sure. And, and I've had to change my whole vocabulary in speaking to my students, which is very frustrating because I used to be the expert in the room, and now I am the beginner in the room, talking to a bunch of kids who know this medium so much better than I do. It's it it is it is humiliating how little I know about the computer and and its capabilities. And they do stuff that this young woman who did that film with in the shower, she did that. I, I get, call me in three weeks and I might, you know, have figured out how to do something like that. But I don't, it's so it's, it's a, the whole paradigm of teaching is upside down because of this, because I'm not the expert in the room. I'm just another I who's able to add a perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jehan, what would you like to say? Yeah, please. I guess I'm just coming back to this because I'm also looking, I mean, I, from what I'm trying to keep up with you in terms of the idea of metaphorization of, of, of this and uh, back to Moenia uh, and uh, even from Daniel's example um, about how these kids are so bright and they're coming up with everything. And I'm just thinking about what are you know, we came in as the experts, we uh, now have started to train differently, thinking, well, what can we do with what we know in this medium? And even that, I feel somewhere is the resistance to change and resistance to transfer, because we're still trying to 
somewhere I'm speaking personally, but I I do hear this in a lot of other people's conversations. We're still trying to we're find we're trying to find our relevance in the space. Um, you know, and that's part of, that's the truth. I mean, like like what do I have to offer? And there's our relevance in the space is still a, a place where, and I wonder whether that's a good thing or sometimes it actually limits us from seeing what really is possible coming out of these students. And then, then I'm just thinking about about well, what are the things that we can, what are the things that theater training does and can do? Um, it you know, uh, Monia, I think you said it earlier. You about uh, you, you used this phrase which I didn't quite exactly catch. Um, Hold on, I just put a note into myself. Um, oh God, uh, something complexity and leveraging diversity. Um, and I just wanted to just get a bit more. First of all, I wanted to ask you what complexity uh, and then leveraging diversity. But but do you think there's some universal things that these kids have innate in them that we all had as human beings, as young uh, young people wanting to make a change in the world that we can really like? Is that the anchor point from where we can we can come up with a new purpose for ourselves as teachers? And and what is there elaborate thoughts of that? Did, did, am I am I making sense? My question. Okay. Moenia. Jehan, just say that last bit again. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> no, like. like so yeah, the relevance it's it's two thirty yeah. Uh, <laughs> you win. The relevance, uh, our relevance in terms of how how do we tap into what is innately uh, inherent in in us trying to be good human beings, etc. Um, and and where do we find like to find a new locus standby in the room as teachers holding space in which these guys can be the best versions of themselves because they're already outgunning us and outdoing us. Uh, we're already catching up with them, but should we be catching up with them in trying to with our old expertise, or, or or do we have to just completely realize that there's something else that we can do to enhance what they're already bringing into the room? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is a response to your question, but I'll I'll riff off what you what you're saying, and um, it's making me think about uh, the Fees Fall protests here in South Africa that, you know, kind of ran for a few years in a row. Um, and I'm particularly thinking about that in relation to this idea of relevance, because if, if there was ever a point where particular kinds of relevance um, was being challenged head on um, in a university setting, um, it was around Fees Must Fall, um, where you know, students across the country were um, uh, protesting for free, decolonized quality education um, were the demands that the, that, uh, the students were calling for. And um, I think different universities and different departments at particular universities handled that time in very different ways. Bongeni, I don't know if you were at UCT and you want to speak to what the UCT scene was like at the time. Was I um, ever. But... It was my first year here. Within weeks oh, of arrival. <laughs> within weeks of arrival. <laughs> yeah, um, complicated time. And, 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 and I think you're right. Is it, Similarly to now, actually, and the kind of COVID moment was one of those moments where we had to really think carefully and deliberately about what the underpinnings of our teaching practice, but also the things we were teaching um, were. And, and those moments definitely show up, I think, uh, what, what uh, we was talking, Daniel was talking about is, is in many ways, we aren't the experts though. Um, we have certain areas of expertise, but we aren't the know-it-alls that I think our position, our professional position often incorrectly kind of, you know, places upon us and students see us as. Um, yeah, it, 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 there, there are those similarities that I'm seeing as well between now and, and that moment. Um, but it's this constant recognition that you, you kind of have to de-emphasize your, your assumed position of authority in order to be able to listen and hear and, and recognize where your limitations are and where the limitations of the practice are as well. Um, just to jump in. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the sounds you're hearing, I was cooking and then I decided to join... <laughs> 
say something. So lots happening at the same time. Um, I, I thought I'd go back and have a look at the word pedagogue. You know, we all know, or it's this word of a, it used to be the slave that took the student to school. It wasn't the teacher. It was the slave that took the student to school, maybe imparting a bit of knowledge on the way. So sort of answering Jana's question, Jahan's question, sorry. Um, I, I think there's an establishment, one, I'm, I'm not gonna, I think we shouldn't bash ourselves about they have more knowledge, they're more, you You know, it's not, a, it's not a competition, it's not a, what, what I think the gig might be is to take the student to the school to take the student to the river, to take the student to the place where they learn, they do the learning. I think our job, the way I see it, is establishing the rule, showing them the rules, not even establishing the rules, showing the rules, and then you go, here are, here are some rules. You've got to know them before you break them. Here's my experience of 30 years to show you the rules, or 10 years, or 20 years. Here are the rules, and then, of course, you were you bring your life experience, you bring your interests, you bring your questions, you bring your interrogation, you bring your journey, and you break the rules the way only you can break them. But there's an element of I wouldn't bash. I don't think we should be all here bashing ourselves. That I think there's I think there's still the role of the pedagogue, but the role of the pedagogue is not to do the learning or the or in fact the teaching. I think. I think it's here. Here's here's the way to the school, and then the the kids, the students, the the other teachers, the other people we work with. But I I, I think what I'm saying is that there's a, I'm not intending to bash myself over the head with that, but um, I think that there's a tension still between the the struggle to find a new relevance by you know we've been teaching in this space for all these years and now we're suddenly teaching in this space and how do we make ourselves relevant? And there's that tension on that end. And then then to do exactly what you're saying uh, on this end. But also I I'm I doubt myself sometimes about what am I listening for with the, with, with the new students, with the students coming in right now. Every batch and the, this, this last digital medium batch that we've had, uh, because this, this medium tends to, to heighten the word and the thought and the intellect, uh, they are they are more woke than I have ever seen and dealt with before. We use a, a different kind of terminology, uh, very loosely. But catching up or keeping up with them, or wondering if I'm just missing the point when I'm in a room with them, is very. It's a very prevalent sort of fear and thought. And so I think my question was really, how do I listen for? How do I listen to enhance or hold the space for them to do their learning? You know, do I am I even like, am I walking in there blindfolded and with, with earmuffs on is, 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 the, is the fear? I think you show them more in your candor about how you're listening than you might think. That the very fact that you're asking yourself this question, you, I would ask that question out loud with them in the room because it, the metaphor I've always used as a teacher is that I'm the person in the room with the flashlight. I'm not the one who knows anything that you need to know because what I know works for me and it probably won't work for you, but I have a flashlight. The reason they gave me the flashlight is because I've been doing this for a long time. And today the flashlight, we're going to look at this, 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 the frame right here. Where, where it goes down and across. And then we call this a perpendicular. And, and so, you know, today we're looking at perpendiculars. And now you tell me what you see there and, and the conversation, but by virtue of the fact that you're asking the question is such a different paradigm than I went to school in. I did not go to school where people ask questions. I went to school where people told answers and that I was to learn those answers and then I would be doing the right thing in school. And, and I think that, that what we are finding and with my more woke colleagues of whom I consider you guys, particularly Amy, because I know her so well, uh, and Norman, 
because I know him. Uh, those are the people who are showing students that we don't know and that in fact, it's not about knowing, it's about preparing yourself for the investigation. And that, and that we're, not, we're not imparting knowledge the way it used to be. We are, we are equipping ourselves with, with the jerry-rigging uh, elements of a MacGyver to go in and discover what we're supposed to go looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's very interesting because we, you know, we started talking about sort of, you know, what are the what are the topics in a sense of of, uh, and then is it, the, now we're sort of wondering what it is to teach at all. But I just I just wonder if if implicit in um, Mgeni and Mwenya, your your um, your interests, it, it seems that that this mode of asking a question that might be implicitly the methodology that you use. I'm just wondering because if you're talking about voicing as a as a as a way to find identity and and transcendence, a way to apply. I mean, these seem to be implicitly investigations rather than um, information being delivered by teachers to 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 uh, you know silent students. I'm. I'm I, I, I think we, we, we're probably at this point talking about method. Um, so this sort of tension between topic and method, is that, is that sort of what's going on with like- A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think that is the trick is to, um, or certainly that's, that's my own investment. And <laughs> my own interest is, in, is not necessarily in, in coming in and offering my expertise in order to deliver answers but to frame and model ways of engaging in conversation hmm. and recognizing that that conversation is generative, it yields things. There may be things that aren't necessarily useful to me <laughs> in my professional position, but the act of conversing and listening to and with each other, I think is, is the beginning point for recognizing that we all have capacity to make knowledge in a particular way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 yeah. We we just uh, sorry, we just have a couple of minutes, and Israel, you've raised your hand. Please speak out your question you had or, or your comment you had earlier posted in the chat. Um, sorry, my video is off because of the bandwidth. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, my, yeah, my thought really is probably starting from where um, um, Daniel mentioned about um, about being present in the class or. Um, in a rehearsal as it were where is the position of the teacher at that point you know it, it's in front of them behind them because that again sort of changes the narrative of the conversation or the class dynamics because uh, um, if, if you're going to be giving answers or giving questions the position of the teacher actually sort of like is it on a round table or a long table? So how does that fit in? Um, um, that's, that's one, for instance, you know, um, just about voicing earlier on, my concern really is about how we, we see voicing sometimes from a Western perspective, not thinking probably like Jehan about body, is there an African body, a Nigerian body, as it were. So Rotimi sort of, try to rearrange that in some of his plays. So you take a word like EH, for instance, air, uh, and you could make a conversation out of that. You know, it, it depends on how you, you put your stress button, but, but, but the audience can understand what he's saying, what the actors are saying on stage. So it's just one word, E-H, and then they just play with it and, and begin to get um, um, some dialogue, some out of, uh, out of that. Cheers. Marvelous, thank you, thank you. Um, that's a really wonderful um, example and uh, demonstration. Um, and uh, I would love to keep on uh, riffing. Uh, I am 
tasked with creating a hard stop. And so I shall do that and then invite everybody to just stick around because nobody disappears. It's just, we just, it turns into a kind of, um, you know, water cooler type situation. So um, uh, thank you so much for coming to this uh, first uh, session yeah. of our second season. And um, uh, really looking forward to next Thursday's um, uh, session with Mgeni. Uh, we will be moving to you and you will be, uh, no, sorry, is that correct? No. Sorry, yeah, Moenia, apologies. I, my heart almost jumped out. <laughs> I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. <laughs> I didn't have my notes. Um, so Moenia, uh, we will be jumping to you. Uh, please, uh, Jihan, can I just have one more minute because I want her to please introduce, uh, Moenia, please tell us your, um, your, your, who will be your interlocutor and what will be the topic? Ah, uh, sure. Quick, briefly. Um, I will be in, will be in conversation with a woman named Ndoni Kanyile, who is actually a, a close friend and colleague of mine who also studied at UCT and she is um, a poet and a writer and has moved in really interesting ways into coaching and facilitation work. And so we are, yeah, we'll be speaking to her about her, her career journey and the kinds of choices that she has made um, along the way. Wonderful. And what time Cape Town will it be? 10 a.m. Cape Town. Okay. Work it out for yourselves. 10 a.m. Cape Town. That's all. That's what I know. The DSM team will the DSM team will help you all figure it out. But we mean it when we want to say coming to a time zone near you. We mean it. Um, it's uh, it's a good time for everybody. It'll be morning in, in London and Europe and it'll be, so we have these three time zones just very quickly. Uh, and the, the three time bands are when America sleeps, uh, when Australia sleeps, when India sleeps. And as you can say, when India sleeps and we're all here. So these are the, th these are the three time, the general time bands. Uh, as Amy said, it's a, it's a movable feast. If you love it, you'll just keep up and catch up and come find yeah. us. Um, it's like that traveling circus that pops up in the middle of the forest sometimes and people who hunt after it can't. Okay. Um, but if you miss the talks, they're all on howl round. Um, right now, just, uh, I think we can say thank you to, uh, Amy for, 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 um, uh, helming this first one and showing our new curators and, and, uh, how it all works by running them through it. Thank you all for coming here and being part of the season two premiere. Um, it really means it and so good to see so many uh, faces back in uh, and new people from Edna Manley College. Uh, I want to know where Elizabeth is as well, so I can't wait to have all of you back. Um, and we will broaden our scope and we will, we will broaden our, our, our group of people who show up. Um, and so I really, uh, in terms of interlocutors in America and all of that, as we find our feet in this new format, but just keep coming. And literally the next day, uh, the talk is there live for recording in case you miss it uh, with some highlights in there. And of course, four or five, uh, a couple of weeks later, the full reported piece comes up and everything can be found on the website. Um, and uh, it's really great that you're all here. Uh, at this point, we formally end the recording. Um, uh, so 